Good evening, everybody! Y'all ready for your bedtime story? I know that I am. Got the lamp fired up. Tonight we're going to be reading The Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millen. Wait. Dan Millen. Chapter 1. The gas station at Rainbow's End. Life begins, I thought, as I waved goodbye to Mom and Dad and pulled away from the curb in my reliable old Valiant, its faded white body stuffed with the belongings I'd packed for my first year at college. I felt strong, independent, ready for anything. Singing to myself above the radio's music, I sped north across the freeways of Los Angeles then up and over the grapevine, connecting with Route 99, which carried me through the green agricultural flatlands stretching to the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains. Just before dusk, my winding descent through the Oakland Hills brought me a shimmering view of San Francisco Bay. My excitement grew as I neared the Berkeley campus. After finding my dormitory, I unpacked and gazed out the window at the Golden Gate Bridge and the lights of San Francisco sparkling in the darkness. Five minutes later, I was walking along Telegraph Avenue, looking in shop windows, breathing the fresh Northern California air, savoring the smells drifting out of tiny cafes. Overwhelmed by it all, I walked the beautifully landscaped paths of the campus until after midnight. The next morning, immediately after breakfast, I walked down to Harmon Gymnasium, where I'd be training six days a week, for muscle straining, somersaulting, Sweaty hours each day, pursuing my dreams of becoming a champion. Two days passed, and I was already drowning in a sea of people, papers, and class schedules. Soon, the months blended together, passing and changing softly like the mild California seasons. In my classes, I survived. In the gym, I thrived. A friend once told me I was born to be an acrobat. Certainly had the look of the part. Clean cut. Short brown hair, a lean, wiry body. I'd always had a penchant for daredevil stunts. Even as a child, I enjoyed playing on the edge of fear. The gymnastics room had become my sanctuary, where I found excitement, challenge, and a measure of satisfaction. By the end of my first two years, I had flown to Germany, France, and England, representing the United States Gymnastics Federation. I won the world tramp champion tramp. Tramp chip chip chip. I won the world trampoline championship. My gymnastics trophies were piling up in the corner of my room. My picture appeared in the Daily Californian with such regularity that people began to recognize me and my reputation grew. Women smiled at me. Susie, a savory, unfailingly sweet friend with short blonde hair and a toothpaste smile, paid me amorous visits more and more often. Even my studies were going well. I felt on top of the world. However, in the early autumn of 1966, my junior year, something dark and intangible began to take shape. By then, I'd moved out of the dorm and was living alone in a small studio behind my landlord's house. During this time, I felt a growing melancholy, even in the midst of all my achievements. Shortly thereafter, the nightmare started. Nearly every night, I jerked awake, sweating. Almost always, the dream was the same. I walk along a dark city street. Tall buildings without doors or windows loom at me through a dark, swirling mist. A towering shape, cloaked in black, strides toward me. I feel rather... I feel rather than seeing a chilling specter. A gleaming white skull with black eye sockets that stare at me in deathly silence. A finger of white bone points at me. The white knuckle bones curl into a beckoning claw. I freeze. A white-haired man appears from behind the hooded terror. His face is calm and unlined. His footsteps make no sound. I sense somehow that he is my only hope of escape. He has the power to save me. But he doesn't see me, and I can't call to him. Mocking my fear, the black hooded death whirls around to face the white-haired man, who laughs in his face. 
Stunned, I watch. Death furiously makes a grab for him. The next moment, the specter is hurtling toward me as the old man seizes him by his cloak and tosses him into the air. Suddenly, the Grim Reaper vanishes. The man with the shining white hair looks at me and holds out his hand in a gesture of welcome. I walk toward him, then, then directly into him, dissolving into his body. When I look down at myself, I see that I'm wearing a black robe. I raise my hands and see bleached, white, gnarled bones come together in prayer. I'd awake with a gasp. One night, early in December, I lay in bed listening to the howling wind driving through a small crack in the window of my apartment. Sleepless, I got up and threw on my faded Levi's, a t-shirt, sneakers and down jacket, and walked out into the night. It was 3.05 a.m. I walked aimlessly, inhaling deeply the moist, chilly air, looking up into the starlit sky, listening for a rare sound in the silent streets. The cold made me hungry, so I headed for an all-night gas station to buy some cookies and a soft drink. Hands in my pockets, I hurried across campus, past sleeping house past sleeping houses before I came to the lights of the service station. It was a, a bright fluorescent oasis in a darkened wilderness of closed food joints, shops, and movie theaters. I rounded the corner of the garage adjoining the station and nearly fell over a man sitting in the shadows, leaning his chair back against the red tile station wall. Startled, I retreated. He was wearing a red wool cap, gray corduroy pants, white socks, and Japanese sandals. He seemed com comfortable enough in a light windbreaker, though the wall thermometer by his head registered 38 degrees. Without looking up, he said in a strong, almost musical voice, Sorry if I frightened you. Oh, uh, that's okay. Do you have any soda pop? Only a fruit juice here. And don't call me pop. He turned toward me and with a half smile removed his cap, revealing shining white hair. Then he laughed. That laugh! I stared blankly at him for one more moment. He was the old man in my dream. The white hair, the clear, unlined face, a tall, slim man of fifty or sixty. He laughed again. In my confusion, I somehow found my way to the door marked office and pushed it open. Along with the office door, I had felt another door opening to another dimension. I collapsed onto an old couch and shivered, wondering what might come screaming through that door into my orderly world. My dread was mixed with a strange fascination that I couldn't fathom. I sat breathing shallowly, trying to regain my previous hold on the ordinary world. I looked around the office. It was so different from the sterility and the disarray of the usual gas station. The couch I was sitting on was covered by a faded but colorful Mexican blanket. To my left, near the entryway, stood a case of neatly organized traveler's aids. Maps, fuses, sunglasses, and so on. Behind a small dark brown walnut desk was an earth-colored corduroy upholstered chair. A spring water dispenser guarded a door marked private. Near me was a second door that led to the garage. What struck me most was the home-like atmosphere of the room. A bright yellow shag rug ran its length, stopping just short of the welcome mat at the entry. The walls had recently been painted white, and a few landscape paintings lent them color. The soft, incandescent glow of the lights calmed me. It was a relaxing contrast to the fluorescent glare outside. Overall, the room felt warm, orderly, and secure. How could I have known that it was to be a place of unpredictable adventure, magic, terror, and romance? I only thought then a fireplace would fit nicely in here. Soon my breathing had relaxed, and my mind, if not content, had at least stopped whirling. This white-haired man's resemblance to the man in my dream was surely a coincidence. With a sigh, I stood, zipped up my jacket, and sallied forth in the chill air. Soon, my breathing had relaxed. I already read that part. He was still sitting there. As I walked past and stole a last quick look at his face, a glimmer in his eyes caught mine. His eyes were like none I'd seen before. At first, they seemed to have tears in them ready to spill over. Then the tears turned into a twinkle, like a reflection of starlight. 
I was drawn deeper into his gaze until the stars themselves became only a reflection of his eyes. I was lost for a time, seeing nothing but those eyes, the unyielding and curious eyes of an infant. I don't know how long I stood there. It could have been seconds, or minutes, maybe longer. With a start, I became aware of where I was. Mumbling a good night, feeling off balance, I hurried toward the corner. When I reached the curb, I stopped. My neck tingled. I felt that he was watching me. I glanced back. No more than fifteen seconds had passed. There he was, standing on the roof. His arms crossed, looking up at the starry sky. I gaped at the empty chair, still leaning back against the wall. Then up again. It was impossible. If he had been changing a wheel on a carriage made from a giant pumpkin drawn by huge mice, the effect couldn't have been any more startling. In the stillness of the night, I stared up at his lean shape, an imposing presence even at a distance. I heard the stars chime like bells singing, singing in the wind. Suddenly, he snapped his head around and stared directly into my eyes. He was about sixty feet away, but I could almost feel his breath in my face. I shivered, but not from the cold. That doorway where, where reality dissolved into dreams cracked open again. I looked up at him. Yes, he said. Can I help you? Prophetic words! Excuse me, but... You're excused, he smiled. I felt my face flush. This was starting to irritate me. He was playing a game with me, but I didn't know the rules. All right, how'd you get up on that roof? Get up on the roof, he queried, looking innocent and puzzled. Yes, how'd you get from that chair, I pointed up, up to that roof in less than twenty seconds. You were leaning back against the wall right there. I turned, walked over to the corner, and you... I know exactly what I was, I was doing, his voice boomed. There is no need to describe it to me. The question is, do you know what you were doing? Of course I know what I was doing. I was getting angry now. I wasn't some child to be lectured to. But I desperately wanted to find out the old man's gimmick, so I held my tempter. Temper. And requested politely. Please, sir, tell me how you got up on the roof. And he just stared down at me in silence until the back of my neck began to get prickly. Finally, he replied, used a ladder. It's around back. Then, ignoring me, he looked upward again. I walked quickly around back. Sure enough... There was an old ladder le leaning crookedly against the back wall. But the ladder's top was at least five feet short of the roof's edge. Even if he could have used it, which was highly doubtful, that wouldn't explain how he got up there in a few seconds. Something landed on my shoulder in the darkness. I gasped and whirled around to see his hand. Somehow he'd gotten off the roof and crept up on me. Then, I guess the only possible answer, he had a twin. They obviously got their kicks, scaring the wits out of innocent visitors. I accused him immediately. All right, mister, where's your twin? I'm nobody's fool. He frowned slightly, then started to roar with laughter. Ha! That clinched it. I was right. I'd found him out. But his answer made me less sure of myself. If I had a twin, do you think I'd be the one wasting my time standing here talking with nobody's fool? He laughed again and strode toward the garage, leaving me standing open-mouthed. Couldn't believe the nerve of this guy.